check, 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 <laughs> Hello, everybody. How are you doing today? One of the, the tricky things when you have a microphone that's got a connected by wire to your computer is that if you try to walk away and go to the sink to get some water for your paint, it causes a whole catastrophe. So <laughs> every, every day is a learning experience. Um, and that brings us to what we're going to do today. We are going to learn how to modify our colors using black and white and gray, which is often the forgotten way to modify a color. Often people think about adding white and often people think about adding black, but people forget that adding gray also changes the color and it changes it differently than either white or black. Um, which is why you can buy gray f directly from an art supply store. Um, but of course, it's not that hard to mix it yourself. So we're going to learn how to, how to really maximize those two different colors in our, in, uh, in our paint box um, tool kit. And then, I, then over the next number of classes, we're going to be able to use all of this knowledge to make some really, really cool paintings. Okay, so I'm gonna get my paint uh, stuff set up here. And um, I've made a nice little handy box that everything can fit in. I'm not sure how everybody else has, has got your system organized, but I just find having a box that everything can fit in just helps keep me organized so that things aren't spread all over the room. So basically the only thing that I had to get today, as I mentioned before, was my water otherwise everything is in this little box which again if you think about like other kind of hobbies that you could have you know i think painting kind of gets a bad rap sometimes because we think about like how uh, some people think it's really expensive it's really messy and it takes up a lot of space and it can smell and you know uh, artists even can use those as excuses to not paint right so, but when I think about it, like if I wanted to take up like, um, you know, running, yeah, you know, only maybe it only takes a couple of pairs of runners, but I got to go somewhere to run or I've got a treadmill. I've got a treadmill right over there that it takes up like half of the room, right? So um, painting all in all is actually relatively inexpensive. If we consider maybe there's a hundred dollars worth of supplies in here, but that's going to last me for maybe six months right a new pair of runners you know if you want to get a, a decent pair of runners is at least 100 bucks right um okay so get all my paints out we are we're gonna do what's called a value chart and that was the image that was in the thumb the youtube thumbnail and it so we're gonna you could use a big piece of paper or your sketchbook to do this activity you know, it depends on how you, you think about it. You know, some people would say this is just, you know, a um, painting exercise rather than a painting in and of itself. But the, 
you know, if you do a nice job of it, maybe it's something you do want to have hanging. Maybe not in the living room above the couch, but having it somewhere accessible that you can bring out and refer to you. In the same way that uh, our color wheel, right, might not be, you know, the kind of thing that they're going to hang next to the Mona Lisa in the Louvre. It is also something, it for us, could be something you hang somewhere in your studio so you can pull it down and maybe even compare with a little bit of paint on your brush. So, um, I'm going to open one of these fellows uh, because, you know, painting on, th in this sense, using a uh, paint board can be kind of helpful because if we paint on this and we want to use this to refer to, um, rather, it's going to, it's still kind of stiff and it won't bend too easily or get wrinkled. Whereas if, you know, I'm just painting on a loose piece of paper and I want to keep this around for my, for reference, you know, it's, it's going to take a little bit of a beating going in and out of my, uh, my box of paints. Okay. I'll also show you another little thing. I'll, I'll show you the overhead version, but what I did, actually, maybe, might as well just give you the overhead. Right? Um, so what I went and did, this is my paint palette. And you can see uh, um, last week I left it inside of this box. So rather than cleaning my palette, I just put it directly in here to, dr to not dry, actually to keep it moist so that I could take it out and continue painting on it. Um, this time I cleaned it off. I actually set it in the sink to, to, so the paint could kind of soak in the water and then washed it off. Another, just a little quick tip about that is what I often will do is if I'm going to clean my palette right off before I wash it, or before I wash it, I will clean it off with like a little rag just so there's less paint going down the sink. And you know, if you're cleaning your paints in your kitchen sink or your bathroom sink, some paint could stain those sinks, right? So having big globs of paint is not ideal to go down your kitchen sink. Um, so you can also see what I've done is I've, I've hot glue gunned a couple, I just took a uh, kind of a, a lid from a takeout container and I cut it up. Actually, it was kind of a little bit larger one than that one. And then I hot glue gunned it like literally 10 minutes ago to the back side of this because my intent is going to be to stick these little things like cool yellow, right? And warm it's warm red etc on here now obviously I know what these are but maybe I don't do the always the best job of telling people what color I'm picking and I just want those things to be self-evident for you so I didn't have time to, to fix it today and I was also thinking let's just see how this works with these kind of big pieces of plastic sticking out there before I label it um, because maybe it's going to be more of a problem or maybe they'll break off. And I also just realized that this will prevent, I think it won't, I don't think it's going to fit back in here properly. So anyway, I, I'm always interested in trying to anything that I can do to make my painting process easier and um, less confusing so that I don't I have to do the least amount of thinking possible that's I'm always like how can I make this so that I'm not having to pause and kind of wait a second that I can just look at it and go boom okay I'm done and I'm just gonna move on and keep on painting so that's that was a little bit of an addition that I made over this course of this past week okay so I'm going to show on, well, you know, I'm going to, I'll show you on the screen, the version, the, uh, the value scale 
that we're going to paint right off the top. Um, so what's a bit? Let's do a pop um, picture in picture here. Um, hmm. No, that's not going to work. Uh, let's do this. Okay, this is going to be awesome. Okay, so there we are on the screen right now you can see a value scale. So this helps to identify um, what the colors are gonna look like when we modify them with white, gray, and black. All right, so if at some point you get confused, um, this is ultimately what we're going to be creating. So just as a, as a quick little um, introduction, on one of these uh, triads or triptychs here, um, in these three columns, we have tints. So tints are what happen when we add white to a color. So we tint a color. Um, or when you add a color to white. So, you know, often if you go actually to Home Depot or Rona or any other you know, Sherwin-Williams or a paint, any place that can mix paint for you, often what they'll say is we can, you know, they, they, they'll claim, you know, we'll, we can create tints for you because often paint, when you get it, industrial paint from an, uh, a hardware store, they take a white can of paint and then they add pigment to it. And this is a little bit of a preview as to what we're gonna do and what happens when we add white to a color or, or, or color to a white is that when we is white is a very opaque color right so, which is why people uh, you know if somebody graffitis on on the side of a building we would paint white over top of it as opposed to painting you know if you had a, a gray wall or a gray is not an example, let's say a red wall you'd, you'd want to paint white over it first and then red because the white covers other colors really, really well, right? So it's very opaque, very little comes through the, um, that layer of paint, right? So, and, and you'll notice this, you know, based on, um, let's say, any of the other paintings that we made over the, the course of the last little while. Right, so let's say this painting, where we were painting directly onto the white surface, you know, I can see my pencil lines through here, I can see my brush strokes, and if I've painted over another color, often the previous color is still slightly visible, because most other colors in the paint box are, are semi-transparent. Very few of them are totally opaque, whereas white is a very opaque color. Right, meaning you can't see through it, right? Transparent being, right, I can see right through it, maybe not clearly, but I can see through it, right? White being I can't see through it. It's opaque. Okay, so um, that's why you would want to mix, like that's why you want to go to the arts or the hardware store, they mix color into the white can of paint so that it's more likely that when you're painting your walls, you're gonna get a nice, even kind of color. Okay. So that's why they'll say, like, we can tint, we can create a tint of any color you like, right? Um, we'll jump over tones here and go to shades. Shade is when we add black to a color, or conversely, when we add color to black. Now, we will see when we start mixing these shades how quickly colors, ch oops, sorry. So we will see how quickly colors change. They'll change radically when we start adding some black to the color. And 
people rarely believe me when they do it until they actually do it. And then it's like, wow, that you were right. You're, you're not kidding around, right? So uh, we're going to do some tints. We're going to do some shades. And then we're also going to do some tones, which is adding gray to a color. Now, again, you know, you could look at this chart and say, okay, yeah, it makes sense. I, I can see what's happening. Great. Sure. I, I'm going to tune out for the rest of the episode because I got it. You know, it, painting is one of those things where a lot of stuff just seems self-evident, very easy. It's not until you actually try to do it yourself where you realize like, oh, this is a little bit trickier than I expected it to be, right? So that's why we want to do this um, uh, together is so that you can have the experience of mixing these colors, seeing the results for yourself so that you don't just have to take my word for anything, right? If you're doing it yourself, you can see it. You, you, it it uh, proves itself. Okay. So like that, actually maybe let's keep this. Sorry, I'm going to keep that chart up, but let's make it. So I'm going to pull this down here. So if I can get my big head out of the way, and I zoom out as much as possible. So I'm going to draw this chart on here, right? So that's why if you have a larger canvas or, or a sketchbook, you could do this in pages of your sketchbook and do, let's say, one here like this and dedicate one page of your sketchbook to each of these right and you can see how kind of sloppy that drawing is but if what we're trying to do is learn these concepts so again it's unlikely that you're going to um, try to you know use this as the front page of your website or for your portfolio or your Etsy store <laughs> So what I'm going to do is, let's say at the top here, I'm going to write value scale. Okay. And then I'm going to draw a big rectangle. Okay. And then I'm going to divide it into th into thirds here, right? So kind of right there and there is thirds. And I'm just going to leave a little bit of a space here. Right? So this is going to be my tints, my tones and my shades here. The other thing if I'm making this a little bit smaller, it's just going to be less space that I actually have to fill with paint. All right. So, and then I'm going to divide each of these into three columns. All right. So if that's easier to kind of make a little mark on either side like this, and that tells me this goes down there, this goes down there, and this goes down here. This goes down there, and this goes here, and this goes there. I am just going to, you could put, um, I could paint over top of, of uh, these little areas here just to kind of make it a little bit more clear. Or you could erase it, it's up to you how you want to do that. So let's now divide this in half here. One, two, three. And one, two, three. And one, two, three. 
and maybe I could write here um, white or tint gray and that's for tone and then black or shade. Okay. So I'm actually going to do two of these. You don't have to do two of them. Um, I'm going to just because I often work a little bit faster than everybody else. Um, because right now we're going to re repeat three colors at a time. Right. So we're going to have maybe on this one we could do the warm um, colors so warm yellow warm red and warm blue like the the image to the right you'll see at the very bottom of that uh, right down here see it says warm colors um, so you could also do another one for cool or cold colors so I'm going to do just that, just since um, I'll have those two available so that I can, if, you know, if it comes up during a class, I will have this here. So let's say I'm going to write value scale. Right, and this I'll do again. And don't worry about making these super pretty. You know, I've uh, every time I teach this, people some well, not everybody, but there's generally a number of people who get really anxious and want a ruler so that they can make nice, pretty, straight lines. Um, I've always I, I kind of actively discourage people from breaking the ruler out. Because it first of all, it slows things down, and uh, because you know people then start having to get the calculator out and make you know every sure all these squares are all the exact right sizes, um, and then it kind of puts in people's minds that there's like a perfect way to do it, and that if you just sort of keep on measuring that you can do it perfectly well. And then if you don't, then you're doing it poorly or bad or um, failing in some way. And that sort of goes against a lot of the, the ways that I think about, um, about painting. Okay, so let's... So that's the, ch I've, I've now got two of these. Maybe one of them I'll label cold colors or cool colors. And so let's now. Come on, buddy. Let's save this one. Okay. Now I'm going to make another one with me and my paint. Okay. Get my big head out of the way. So I'm just going to move one out of the way because I can only do one at a time. And how do I want to, how have I organized this? I think this is, so now let's, I'm going to put, let's, um, I'm going to do my warm colors first. So put some yellow on there. Uh, so I'm going to do my warm, these are my warm, well, these two are warm, and this is going to be a warm over here. So where's my warm red? Right here. 
right, so about as, again, I put as much paint on here as I would normally put um, on my toothbrush. And let's put this blue right down there. And let me see, some people will uh, paint do some of the mixing on another uh, another tray, right? So maybe some people want to do this. Oh, I guess I haven't even opened this white up yet. Oop. Um, I'm going to use lots. I'm, I'm going to use lots of white, a little bit of black today. But rather than squeezing all of the white that I'm going to use during the class out, uh, because the white can get kind of muddy pretty quickly. I'm just going to squeeze what I need to kind of get started first. Okay. Where are my brushes? And just going to check. I saw there's a bunch of comments coming in here, so just want to see everything's going. <laughs> Madeline says she apologizes for being the one with the ruler. That's okay. It's just, I, I think this might be an opportunity, um, a, an invitation to give yourself a little bit more freedom and kind of ease up on yourself a little bit um, so that you're not so worried about making it perfect. Okay, so let's say I'm even going to label, um, this will be my warm colors. And this one here will be for my cool colors. So what I'm going to start by doing is I'm going to paint some yellow. So this is my warm yellow. And I'm going to paint that right up into this corner here. Okay, so you see I got this yellow in here. I'm also going to put it here and here. Whenever I do this, there's also a few people who get confused and they start painting things in the so-called wrong spaces and then they get very you know, anxious about things and get flustered. Um, it don't, you know, if you get something, if you just, if you accidentally put two different yellows or the reds, or you put them in a different order than I am doing, again, don't worry. You could certainly do this exercise again a second time and, uh, try to kind of fix your mistakes the second time around, but I wouldn't worry about, you know, no one's grading you. No one's, there's no final exam on this. What's important is that you, you have the experience of doing this. You understand how the colors are changing and being modified as you add white, black, and gray to them. And if you understand that, it doesn't matter what this looks like at all, right? We could be doing a much sloppier version of this. And if the, if it makes sense to you, then that's, then that's really what's important. Okay, so these three spaces right up top there. Uh, just was it, um, Dr. Jones says, when you add gray or black, you don't add it to the tints. You add it to the primary colors, right? Um, I th if I understand what you're saying... Um, yeah, so technically you could mix black into a tint and you'd have a tone, but maybe that's a little confusing. So we'll, <laughs> we will, uh, we'll, we'll kind of get to it if you, if, uh, if you just keep on kind of, if you trust me a little bit, I'll, I'll, I'll walk you to the promised land here. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll move some mountains and, and separate some oceans together here. Okay. Um, 
But I, I too, what I do acknowledge, though, like, is that some of these ideas, especially the language around painting, um, can be an obstacle in and of itself. There's so many different words, and we've heard these words before, and we often, people use, you know, tints, tones, and shades in their everyday language, and often they use them interchangeably, not really knowing the actual origin of those words. And um, so it can be kind of confusing if, if you've gone to the hardware store and the person behind the desk uses these words interchangeably even though because sometimes people will say oh I want a different shade of red and you know because they're just thinking oh I just want one that's a little bit more orange versus one that's a little bit more pink right and they they're they're assuming that that means a different shade of red just means a different type of red when we're actually technically a different shade of red is a different amount of black that's been added to that color right so I you know, I can understand why some of this gets confusing for some people, and uh, so the language around painting of itself is a little bit tricky. So that's why I'm I'm trying to repeat things a number of times and trying to kind of go slowly with this. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add some white to our warm. We're going to add white to our warm yellow, right, to begin tinting this color. Right, so here's my white. I'll just maybe put it right here. I want to add just a little bit of white, right? So you see how, you know, there's there's a, about as much as maybe I'd put, um, and actually that might be too much white here. So I'm just gonna grab a little bit more yellow and I'll mix this in here. So the point here is. And I think I put this in on this diagram here. As you can see, at the very top row, we're just 100% color, right? 0% white. This next row here is 95% color, 5% white or gray or black, right? And the next one is 50-50. And then the last one is almost entirely white and just 5% color, right? So this first mixture that we're doing is mostly color with just a little bit of white right so we want to see what happens when we do this and you know if you only have five percent white in here your the, the change is is maybe a little bit noticeable but not radically different Right, so one thing that you do, you may notice, and I notice all this, if I paint a little bit out of the lines, it covers my pencil lines better than just the, the yellow on its own. And that goes back to what I was saying before about white being a color that is great for covering up other colors, for covering up graffiti or painting over parts of your painting that you're not happy with. And if you let it dry, you come back and then you've, it's, it's like, it's like using an eraser, basically. Assuming the canvas you used originally was white, but even then, if you had a black canvas, you painted white over it and put a color back down, you know, it would, it would eliminate that, that previous color. Okay, so now let's add a little bit more white to here. Now, I say kind of 50-50, so that's kind of a generous amount of white being added to this color. So now I'm going to paint this in here. And look, I'll even just paint over some of my pencil lines as well, just so you can kind of see. You don't have, if you want to do that yourself, you can. But you can see, like, that line that was there is basically gone, right? It's, should I zoom in just a little bit here? Right? So you can see how well that white works to, to, to cover and hide you know, previous things. All right, so here we have 100% yellow, 95% yellow, 5% white, about 50% yellow, 50% white, and then down here we're gonna do mostly white with just a little bit of yellow. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna 
take my brush and try to roll out some of the, the paint. And then I'm just going to go in here and make a new little... Rub. So I'm basically taking the, the color that was on my brush. I rubbed most of it out. And then I'm just going to take this and I'm going to add this in here. Right, so it's it's almost entirely white, very little color on there, but it still has like this vague yellowish quality. You know, kind of to me this reminds me of of like some kind of like lemon meringue or something, right? Just has a little bit of that egg in there in in the uh, the meringue. Right, so the meringue is the, the white fluffy thing on the top of the pie, right, I think. <coughs> I, I don't know much about lemon meringue pie other than it tastes really good and I like it a lot. <laughs> um, so in that way, I'm an expert at lemon meringue. Um, <laughs> ooh, okay, didn't I have, do I not have a rag started here? Okay, let's uh, use a previous rag here. I'm just, I like reusing some of these materials. Okay, so once I've got that done here, I'm just going to clean my brush off really well. The point of cleaning the brush off is both to keep the brush from, um, you know, the, the paint from hardening up, but it's also to, so that it's, I'm not going to contaminate my next color with the color that was on here before, right? Now, as I showed you in the last class, I kind of like painting with a so-called dirty brush, a, a brush that's already got lots of colors in it, just because I like that variety of color kind of showing up in the painting. But, you know, if you're going for like a really, like a, let's say you're trying to paint the highlight of, you know, um, a dew drop on, on a sunflower, then we would want to have a nice clean brush to get that white. Otherwise, it's going to get dark really quickly. Okay. So once we've done this, get that little shadow out of the way, let's move on to the warm red here. So I've got my warm red. All right, so I can just take this, put this directly on my brush. And I'm going to paint it in these three locations. Um, so ultimately, you know, when we have all of these charts already done, it basically is like the decoder ring for our for our paints we will know like we have a pretty good idea of all of the colors that we can make we'll know how to make them so that when we're when we start to paint there's less of that like mystery of like how do you get that color because we can literally we've got charts that we're you know that will show us how we did it that we can directly refer to and I just find that makes life so much easier um, that yeah, like what's an example there's got to be a I'm always I love using metaphors and analogies and it's, uh, when I'm uh, painting and specifically when I'm teaching because you know, if I can try to find a way to make it relate best um, and, and kind of, you know, I'm always going for that aha moment where people are like, oh yeah, I, yeah, I get that. That makes sense. I can relate to that. That makes a lot of sense. So I'm always trying to, how, what's the way that I can, you know, create that aha moment? And usually uh, that's in those, um, those metaphors. So I'm trying to think of how this is like a, a really good metaphor for something. Okay, just as I... <laughs> Heidi says, is there cake there? I wish, I wish, I wish there was like a, um, 
like PayPal for cakes and, and people would just like click and then all of a sudden there would just be instead of money showing up, it would be like ding ding, there's three cakes and I just go, oh great. And I could have a little bit of cake. Um, probably my, my uh, the kinesiologist that I work out with uh, would, would not say that that would be a good idea. <laughs> Um, okay, so I got, I'm just introducing a little bit of white into this color now, right? So I got a little bit of white and I'm just mixing it here. So when I paint this tint of the, of the red, I might even put a little bit more red on here. The idea is not to make it pink just yet. It's just to, you want this, these two to be very similar and to recognize how little of, of even the white you need to put in there before it changes. Okay, so like on camera, these to me look pretty close but there's a just an, like very in, infinitesimal kind of change here that um, so when we add white to a color it not only makes it more the color more opaque and therefore I could paint over other things with this color even just that when I could paint over another color and that excuse me the previous color would be hidden a little bit um, it's going to also disguise a little bit of the brush strokes. So again, you know, in this previous painting, like you can see in places where there's the brush strokes are, are quite visible, right? Because what, why that's visible is I have different thicknesses of paint in here. Some places where there's more paint on my brush and some places where there's very little and therefore the white of the board is showing through. If I mix a little bit of white into my paint, it's gonna create a more even uh, color so that there's less of the brush strokes showing through or less of the, the different, um, uh, the, the, the thickness of the paint isn't quite as important. Okay, so let's add a little bit more white here, technically like 50-50 to this color. So just take a big scoop of the white in here. Now, obviously, this is this is fairly subjective, right? I'm not actually using a you know scientific instrument or a scale of any kind in order to find that 50/50. I'm just kind of eyeballing it, and you know that would be kind of a nice little mixture, right? So these these two these two rows look fairly similar because there was only again five percent more or five percent white in this mixture here we have like 50 50 so a lot of white in, in that color okay i'm just gonna take my brush and kind of roll out some of this color so there's not much left on there dab some more paint in here And then I'm just gonna paint this last one down here. And again, I could go over top with some of these black lines, being careful that of course, my brush may pick up some of the pencil marks and that could change the color ever so slightly and darken it down. All right, so. I could even add a little bit more white in here. And you see, I just take it and put it directly on there and kind of mixing it into the, the paint, directly onto the painting, right? To lighten it up a little bit. I could do this to the point where there's barely any red in there whatsoever and create really super, super subtle transitions of those colors, which can be really satisfying having that little bit of, um, that little kind of 
change between different kinds of uh, color families, hues. Okay, done that. Okay. So, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to paint the blue. And you know, when I'm doing this in the classroom, there's there's usually some people that are really, really fast. And you know, by the time I'm doing this, they're already halfway, you know, done the rest of the project. And then there's some people that, you know, I bet you there's, you know, probably five or six of you that are still working on the yellow right now and haven't moved on to the red. So, you know, if you if you want, you could pause your computer or your the, the stream right now and just paint until you're done and then you could catch up to where I am now or you could sort of let it run and you kind of get where we're going and then um, and you could kind of watch it and then return to the you know rewind it afterwards so these videos stay up there for as long as there will be the, the web <laughs> okay so I was gonna start mixing the white in there until I you know sometimes I get a little confused when I'm talking away okay so I'm putting the blue into these spaces and I'm just putting those blobs there just so that you know, if people are, are trying to outrace me they, they have an idea of where this color is going to go so I'm also using one of these um, the round brushes as they're called right this kind of pointy brush you could, there's no reason why you couldn't use any other type of brush to do this. I like the kind, these kind of pointy brushes because I can get into these kind of narrow kind of corners and be a little bit more precise. But uh, you, know, you're, you may want to try out different colors and just see how they work for you. Or try out different brushes, sorry. You could also try doing this with a palette knife. You know, we, we talked about palette knife before. I personally don't often use palette knives when I paint with acrylic paint. Uh, palette, as I mentioned before, palette knives are, were in, originally invented or used for mixing the color on your, on your palette. That's why it's a palette knife. Right? You'd mix it here and then put it down, grab your brush because you've got a nice mixed color and then paint with it. But there are artists who use palette knives to actually paint. The most famous of which was uh, Gustave Courbet, the French um, painter, how do you put it, let's say, uh, lived, you know, let's say, 18... 50 to 1910 or something that would be my, my little guess I'll look his name up here in a second so what I'm doing is I took my blue and I added some white and I decided oh you know what maybe there's a little bit too much white so I kind of came back here and adding some blue back into that color the when it comes to to any of these mixtures it's always easier to um, darken a color than it is to lighten a color, right? So and we'll see that especially when we get to the black, which we're gonna do next here when we start adding, doing the shades. That, boy oh boy, if we put a little bit too much black on our paintbrush, it's very hard to lighten it back up. And it's almost the kind of thing where you just want to get a new brush and uh, try mixing again and just saving that mixture that was too dark for another step. Okay. So again, we've got these, these two here are similar, just a tad bit, um, a, a little bit of white in there and I think it might have been a little bit too much water on my brush and I did that too so it's a little bit brushy 
Now I'm just going to add a lot more white onto my brush. Okay, and paint into this area here. And of course, as I do, you know, you can you can try painting over top of your pencil lines again and you'll just see them disappear completely because of the great um, covering power of the white paint. Okay. And then lastly, I am just going to mostly just take some white paint using the blue that's currently on my brush and just paint in this area. Disappears a bit. And there we go. Um, so that that's actually this is the, the blue paint in here. And you know what? Again, I could just clean this up a little bit with white paint. There we go. Okay. So now I'm going to skip over the the grays here, my tones, and we're going to do the black, and then we're going to come back to the gray here in a moment. So to add black to a color, it's exactly, I mean, everything is we're gonna do is exactly the same as what we just did, but it's just adding black. The difference is, is like, man, you barely need to put any black on your brush whatsoever before you notice some really radical changes. So I'm actually gonna do this mixing right on my palette here. How can I do this so you can see? So here's my black. My This is a clean brush, right? There's nothing on this brush. And I am going to take a little bit. I mean, I don't even know if you can see how much paint is on here. Like there's a bit of black on there, not much at all. All right, let's scoop some yellow on here. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. A little bit of black, like that changes the color so quickly, right? So much so that you see I'm kind of mixing to the side of that mixture, right? So when I'm done that, I'm just gonna move over and I'm gonna paint this right in here. All right, so it looks, I mean, it looks almost like this, but it just, to me, it, it starts to look more like of a mustard yellow, right? This may be your, your, fr your French must mustard or French's mustard, you know, for hot dog mustard. And then we start getting into a little bit more of a, a Dijon mustard or something as we go here. All right, so it's, it almost has a bit of a greenish hue, like a very, very little bit of green or something in there, All right? That black. But I mean, you saw like, I, there was maybe one or two grains of salt worth of black that I put on the tip of my paintbrush and it changed that color, right? And in fact, I didn't even, I used maybe half a grain of, of, of salt worth because there's still that other big area of black that I, I didn't use, All right? So let's, um, Everything's okay. Um, 
I, Dr. Joe says he trusts me. Okay, good. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Um, so now let's add maybe a lot more black to this mixture. Oops. Just stuck my fingers in the red paint. There. Which happens all the time. Getting your fingers dirty. So I'm going to take a little bit more. You know, this is, that's how much black I just took onto my brush. Again, you can see I don't need, I mean, this blob of black that I put on there is way more black than I'm going to use for, for this class. All right, so I'm going to uh, take more here. Right, if I wanted to lighten this mixture up so that it came back to this, I would probably need half of the paint still in my tube. Where does my yellow tube? Oh, there it is. Right? I would probably need, like, I, and I'm not kidding around, like, to get this color again with this current mixture, I would need to use about that much paint. That's, you know, that's why when I see people making these big mixtures, I'm like, whoa, 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 just slow down and see what the color looks like before you mix all of that paint and then you're kind of stuck with this big mixture okay i'm gonna paint this in here okay there's another one I mean, you saw there was maybe six. So this wasn't even technically 50-50 black because 50-50 black and yellow would be very, very, very dark, right? So it's, everything's kind of, it's not this nice, precise scientific method here. I just want you to be able to see how quickly that changes because people are always surprised how quickly the black uh, becomes, how dark it becomes so quickly. So now I'm just basically taking the black that I had on my brush before, getting a little bit of yellow back into it, and I'm going to paint this right down here. So for the most part, it looks like if I didn't know, if I didn't have an actual black next to it to paint, like I could paint actually black down here, and you'd see that it's this is not a pure black like it's got it looks a little bit like almost like I've got a bit of white in there actually so yours it for when I look at it on the computer screen this looks like a big black solid area but it's a little bit lighter and hopefully when I start painting these you'll see a little bit of variety here so in the same way that we saw a little bit of variety with my tints right Okay, so I'm gonna grub this paint off and then wash my, my paint. And you can see also, I, I notice this all the time when people are painting that their, their water gets dirty really, really quickly. And when I'm teaching in classes, you know, there's often people are getting up every five minutes to clean the water of their, uh, in, you know, that they're using. And that's because people are just taking a paintbrush. It's loaded up with paint, dipping it right in here to clean it. And, you know, it's kind of like if you've got a sink full of dishes and you've kind of scraped all of the food off, right? And, and they're, so they're all, they're not clean, but they're not, they don't have food on it. And you're trying to wash those dishes. And then somebody who's got like a steak that's half eaten full of sauces and french fries and salad and they just put their dirty dish right into the sink of your and you're like Ugh, look at that water like I'm, there's no way i'm going to be able to clean any of those dishes with this sink that's now full of like grease and sauces and all that stuff right so if i'm cleaning my brush just wiping it off a little bit before i i rub it around in here I mean, I could use this same water for hours and hours and hours without actually having to change it, right? Um, okay, so let's go down here and we're gonna 
change the, um, the red by adding some shade to it or adding black to it. So we're going to create some red shades. Um, okay, so again, I'm going to take my, oops, let's move this over here. I've just got my clean brush with some red. I just took right out of that. that and I'm careful not to take it where the white was because that would be a tone, right? So I'm just taking right out of this gob of paint there. And then, you know, again, I'm taking like an almost invisible amount of black on here. And I'll just kind of put it down and you can see that little bit of black, how far it goes. It's crazy, right? So I'm just going to mix it back in here and I keep putting my fingers into the paint. <laughs> um, okay. And then I'm going to paint this in here. So you can see it's it's a little bit um, different than the, uh, the the one where it's just pure red in here, and now it's been modified. I've got now a darker shade of red, right? And that was barely any black in there whatsoever. Again, there's still plenty of that that little two or three grains of of black salt, if we use that metaphor in here um and, and following that that same metaphor of, of salt is i think about like mixing my paints and when i'm doing adding changing the value of the paint to um to like making a soup or something right and you know seasoning a soup right you don't want to just oh it needs some salt okay i'm gonna take the shaker just and try to fill it and then you taste again like whoa that's too salty right you just put a little bit in Mix it up, taste it. Needs a little bit more, a little, right? Otherwise, what are you gonna do with a pot full of super salty uh, soup? Unless it's miso soup, which I love, and it's super salty. Um, okay, so I just took a big gob of, of black. Well, not even a gob, just a tiny bit, really, to be honest. And I'm just gonna mix that into here for this next space. And I can paint this in here. So my plan for the rest of the episode is we're gonna, obviously gonna finish here with the blue and then we're gonna do the grays. And then, do I, oh, I, I might do the, the cool colors on my own, maybe? Or do I want to try to do that in class here? Um, I think, I, you know, once you've got it, you got it, right? There's, you kind of understand the, the principles, so you may not want to kind of stick around and watch me do it. Um, it's kind of up to you, I'm trying to decide it. To use my time most effectively here. You know, I, and again, the the more like you could do this, you could also mix. You could do dozens and dozens of these charts, right? You could do one for all the different kinds of greens that we mixed before. You could do one for oranges. You could do one for the purple. Um, so you can kind of, you know, it's up to you to see how far you actually want to take this. Now, again, on the computer screen, these look basically like one blob of black. With my own eyes, I can see that this one is like a, is a super, super dark red. Like it kind of reminds me of like, you know, a scab, right? You know, like if you've cut yourself and you've got a scab on your finger and it dries and it goes to that really, really, really dark, it's almost black, 
right? But it's still got some red in it. That's what this looks like to me. So it's not fully black and neither is this one. There is some difference. So we wanna be able to show a little bit of difference. Otherwise we would just paint this whole thing black. Okay, so I'm gonna clean this brush off. I've also been doing a lot, so actually, well, maybe I'm gonna start this blue thing before I just start muttering on. Um, so I'm now I'm just gonna continue adding black to the blue here, right? So I'm just going to add a tiny bit of black here. All right, there's barely any on there, you can see, and add it to my blue. The, I think I mentioned before, the, the, the Impressionist painters, the, um, the most famous of which is Claude Monet, um, uh, very, uh, very little, or they either did not use black at all, or they used it very, very sparingly. So they might only use a little bit of black at the very end of a picture for just a few tiny little highlights, or, or not highlights, but you know, to maybe draw in a flagpole or something, right? Or the, or the tire of a car. Um, or they would just mix a really, really dark color uh, because they, they believed that, like, they're really trying to show the, the, the brightness of colors. And, you know, at that same time, the, what was interesting about Impressionism is it coincided with, you know, the large scale industrial production of color, right? Previous to the, to the Impressionists, pre, and so we're talking like 1880 or so, 1860-ish, that period. Previous to then, artists would have to mix their own paints, right? You'd have to go to, uh, like an art supply store back then would have been a lot more like going to a pharmacy, right? And you would, in fact, art supply stores and pharmacies were often the same thing, right? You would go in and they would have like all these powders that you would use for like painkillers. And then they'd have all these powders that you could use for paint. And so you can see how dark this is. This is my blue with a lot more. In fact, maybe it's a little bit too dark. I'm just going to add a little more blue back there. Um, so previous to then, people would have to mix all their colors themselves. And that was a super time consuming process. Um, and it often led to like lots of, you know, inconsistencies. You know, if everyone's making their own paint all the time, or if I had to like literally at the beginning of this class sit here with like measuring different kinds of materials and grinding up pigments together, you know, that could take me hours to do. And what that would ultimately lead to is, is it made it like pretty much all artists had to paint in their studios, right? If, if you have to, you know, mix all of this stuff, you would need all your tools nearby. In kind of the 1860s, 70s, I'm not exactly sure the exact time, uh, the date, but we started, the companies started to produce paint that, that came in tubes, pre-mixed and ready to go. And so that allowed artists to just take their tubes of paint, throw them in a backpack, go for a walk, and make a painting um, outdoors or en plein air, right? Um, and so the, the Impressionists were some of the first to actually do that. And remember, this is before photography. So, you know, nowadays we can go take a photo on our phone, go back to our studio and make a painting of, you know, the landscape or, you know, a, a horse race or something. You know, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, the only way for an, for an artist to make a painting of 
horses racing down a racetrack or ballet dancers making, you know, uh, doing practicing performance like Degas, who did both, those were both themes of his work, um, Edgar Degas, you'd actually have to take your easel, set it up there, and be painting from life, right? Or otherwise, you'd kind of have to make notes to yourself, go back to your studio and paint it, in which case there could be lots of kind of um, distortions from what you actually saw. And to, to, to go on further about that, like the history of photography uh, helped us see like how animals could run. Because if you're trying to make a painting of a horse running, how, like people didn't know, like to, at some point do all the horse's legs come off the ground or, or is there always one leg touching the ground? And this was like, it wasn't until, you know, we're talking thousands of years, people would have these arguments sitting around a campfire and like, no, no, I'm telling you, I've seen the horses, all the legs up off the ground at the same time. No, no, it's a, the horse will fall down if one of the hooves isn't actually touching the ground. I just think it's so interesting how technology has affected the artist process. Okay. Um, okay. So now let's do our grays. So there's two ways to go about this. One of which would be to mix a gray ahead of time and then to always be going back to that gray or to be mixing directly, uh, like to, you mix some um, a tint and then you add a little bit of black to that tint. So I might do a little bit of both just so you see the two different options that are available to you. Okay, so let's say, let's say I'm gonna mix, uh, a, I'm gonna pre-mix a gray because that might be the easiest for, for some of you to do. So I just got this wet brush, just dry it off for a second there. Um, I'm gonna take, oh, let me show the, how I'm doing this here. I'm gonna mix it Let's say right in the center here. So I'm going to take a big scoop, oops, <laughs> of my white, plop it there, All right? And then, oops, I'm not on camera. Well, let me put this down here now. So I'm just basically scooping all the paint. Ideally, paint that doesn't already have any color in there, right? Because that's going to change the colors. And then let's start out with just a little bit of black. Let's start mixing this together. And if I'm going to do this process, this would be where you could use a palette knife to help create these mixtures. So this is a white with just a tiny fraction of black. So... I'm going to add a little bit more into here. Like, look, I barely had any black on that brush, and look how quickly it changed. All right, so let's do this again. You could do this entire exercise with different kinds of, of black, different darknesses of black, different uh, tones. Um, trying to get something that is, so you can see I just keep on adding a little bit more black each time, just like I'm making a soup and I keep on adding just a t few more pinches of salt in there. Okay, until I get something I'm kind of happy with. Now I can do the same sort of, the same exercise back here where I was mixing my whites previously, or my yellows, right? So I'm going to use this same palette here. Maybe I'm just going to back this up a bit so I've got a little more room so you can see overhead a little bit more of what I'm actually doing here. So, there we go. Um, so sometimes a bunch of paint starts to build up on the brush, so I'm just kind of rolling it off. I'm going to scoop it all up and put it into this mixture just to get that consistency. So this, this mixture would have been something, let's say, 90% white to 5% or 
5 to 10% black, so it's still not a lot of black. It would be kind of around one of these mixtures, right? So now I'm going to take this mixture that I've just created, and I'm going to add it to this yellow. All right, so I'm just going to scoop a bunch of this out, put it here, and I want... gray here. And now I'm going to paint this. And here. And I can't tell you how how important it is to do this exercise yourself, especially because the quality of just these digital technologies and being able to convey exactly what I'm doing over the internet and onto your screen and the colors can look a little bit different. It's just, and because I don't know how easily it comes across these differences. And even this kind of template that I've created here can only show so much, right? It's only so accurate. Um, there's just nothing like doing it yourself and actually seeing it, right? So here, it, this, it, I mean, obviously it's it's kind of a combination of both, um, but uh, yeah, I don't know how to, you just kind of got to do it. I, I don't know how else to, to say it. So, added a lot more gray to my mixture. I think I need even more here. And this mixture is is like amazing for covering things, right? I can just go over top of a pencil line and it's just like instantly gone. Like it's it's like hardly was ever there to begin with, right? Okay, and now I'm going to just take mostly gray and put this down here. So it's mostly gray with just a little fraction of yellow in there. So I think, you know, gray is often the one thing that, that people over, you know, it's, it's, it's really the one way that, of, of modifying a color that people forget about. I think people often will either reach for the yellow or for the white or the black, but the, the gray is often the one that is, you know, it has the best properties of, of the tints and the shadows. Um, you've got that great covering power where you can kind of hide things from below and make things a little bit more opaque. Um, and all of these uh, also dull the color. And dulling the color means that it's reducing the saturation, the brightness, the intensity of the color, right? So when we're adding white and black, we're moving away from the outer edges of the color wheel towards that neutral core. Right, so these colors around here just tend to be more naturalistic, right? So they just have a little, they, whereas these colors on the outside are so bright that they're a little bit unreal, right? They're, so often that's the colors people want, but not the colors that they really need when they're painting. So you really want to use those saturated colors very sparingly, like literally little bits of them here and there in a painting, uh, depending, of course, on the type of painting you're trying to make. Okay, now I'm going to add this gray to the red. So I'm going to scoop some red up here, and now I'm going to scoop some of my gray in here. So it's mostly red with just a little bit of gray. Just kind of squeezing some of this gray out. Got a big head in the way there. And then let's paint this in here. A 
I think as soon as I'm done this chart, I'm gonna show you just a few images um, of, uh, I don't know if anybody watched the, did, they, did anybody watch the Gamblin um, Introduction to Color Space video that I suggested last week? Because that is, you know, must watch for sure. I, I, I think I put a link to it in last week's video beyond just kind of showing it. So I'll do that again for this week's episode. Okay, so it's they're similar but different, right? Um, now I'm going to add more gray in here. So the color is kind of lightening up in a way. It's almost, it kind of almost looks like I'm adding a little bit of white to it in that it's kind of um, getting a little bit hazy. Okay, and lastly, we'll do one here. That's maybe too much red. Okay, so you, now you can kind of see a little bit more of the difference between the grays here. All right, so this one's got a little bit more red. This one just sort of has a bit of a... It looks almost gray, but just has this little bit of a greenish quality to it. All right, not particularly appealing kind of color. If, you're, if you got food served to you and it was this color, or any of these colors, you'd be like, oh, yes. Oh, I don't know if I want to eat that. Gross. <laughs> um, I also, I think maybe before I, f I finish up for today, I want to show you um, uh, some of the, the possible paintings that we could make over the next five months together and get your thoughts about that. So in about another five minutes when I'm done painting this blue, I think maybe that's what we'll have some discussion about that because I started doing some research and I got really excited and then I've, I've now kind of got like a list of about like 60 paintings that I want to do. Um, so, um, and I'm, which might even include changing up some of the ideas that I had scheduled for next week already, right? So. I want to be pretty flexible. Okay, so I got a little bit of gray on my brush, mostly blue here. Sometimes it's, it's, you know, if I'm looking at all of these paintings from kind of an angle, so I keep my head out of the camera above. So sometimes it's, it's helpful just to kind of tilting the, the canvas up and down just to see if, if it's looking the way it should look, right? Because very few people are going to look at the canvas from that kind of angle. Okay, so now I'm going to add more gray to this mixture. Oh, I did say I was going to mix it as I go, didn't I? Well, it's a little late for that, isn't it? I was almost done. Um, hmm. Well, if we wanted to mix, just a tad more blue on here. 
Um, if I did want to add, mix a um, gray each time, it's just adding a little bit of black and white to the mixture and kind of mixing it. Maybe, well, I was gonna say, originally I was going to paint that cool one here with the last little bit of time, but I'm kind of taking my time as I paint all of this. And it's... Uh, so it's also probably that this is the pace most of you are also painting at, so it doesn't make too much sense to me to be trying to, to race too far ahead. Okay, so you know, I'm looking at the at the screen. It looks like I can see it, this has turned out pretty well. Like I can see the kind of nice changes here. And honestly, like if I was making a painting, these this gray areas here, like I just feel is more satisfying. Like if like if you just imagine this was a painting on a wall, I feel like this is more satisfying to look at than this, the tints, or the shades. In fact, if anything, the shades on their own have this kind of a dirty quality, right? It's, it's almost sort of looks like the, the paintbrush was dirty or that there's, there's like sand or something into it, right? So it just, and it, the color kind of looks dead and flat. Uh, they kind of have a green, like there's, I mean, it's not to say that you don't ever want to use it, but this is again why the impressionist would say you want to be very careful about how much black or any black you put into the picture because it black, you know, sucks the life and sucks the like quite literally sucks the light out of the the, the reflected light bouncing back to your eye. Um, so it it kind of feels like it sucks the life out of a painting, right? So if you just put black into the shadows. Um, or into the, the, a darker area of the picture, it doesn't just make it look like that's, you know, a shadow. It just sort of looks like this dead area of a picture. And we want the picture to be vibrating full of life, even in the shadows. So, you know, if I was to make a much darker gray or add just a little bit of white to these shades, I guarantee you it would just, there would be something just more like there would be life in those dark areas right i don't it's i don't know, it's this how do you quantify this stuff it's, it's really hard to to say but um uh but it's uh, once you you do it you see it right that's why mixing this stuff is like there's if i could explain it all in words and, and you would all get it instantly without having to do it then there wouldn't be any need for me to do any of this right and nor nor would there be any need for you to do it yourself okay so i i don't know if i want to sit start painting uh the the cool version of this right now Maybe, you know, if people are interested, somebody wants to hang around and, and paint along with me after this, that's, I'm super happy to do that. I think what I do want to do is share my screen again and show you what um, I have planned for us going forward here. So I'll just leave that on or on the screen for a moment. This view here, just for anybody who's still kind of working away. Getting that brush nice and clean. Time for some tea. Especially if you're doing a lot of talking, a little bit of, you need to rehydrate so that I lose my voice. 
Um, a couple things, maybe just while I'm I'm waiting here for people to kind of finish up, is you know if you're if you find this all this content helpful, you it's really helpful for me if you like and subscribe to the channel and you hit that there's a little notification bell so that when I go live it'll pop up on the top of your YouTube feed and if you want you can get notified by email as well through that function but I don't have that and I, I, I'm wrong I have that bell notified for like a dozen different youtubers out there that I follow so that when I open up the YouTube app it'll kind of give me notification kind of like on Facebook it'll say oh here's these people have uploaded new videos so I can go oh directly to that and watch those new videos and same sort of thing because I see all the time on the Facebook comments is like I can't find the latest video what's going on like oh, I'm I, I, and it's just like if you hit the notification bell in your YouTube all you got to do is open up YouTube look at your notifications and you'll see my video it might even say like streaming live right now and you click on it boom easy way to find uh, the uh, uh, this recording or or live recording if it's if it's <laughs> 20 minutes from now this will be a a recorded video um, Linda says she likes the music tonight it goes well with the tea uh, Jeannie says I did your other tint and tone video exercise uh, also good stuff so I, I mentioned, I think, last episode that I did this. What we're doing now, I've done before. It's like a nine-minute kind of short video. Um, uh, about five, four years ago, and I think it's got like a hundred and some thousand views, and people really, really liked it. So what we're doing today is, is really just a, a slow, expanded, doing it in real time so you can see it. Because it's one thing to see it flashing by, and like, oh, okay, that makes sense. It's kind of hard to paint to something like that, right? Um, so eventually I'm going to edit these down into shorter kind of clips. So you're seeing kind of the raw behind the scenes footage of, of these episodes, of those episodes when they're eventually made. Um, okay. I want to show you the plan. to to load up here um, uh, yes sue says yes the music is very calming uh, Madeline says I definitely wasn't expecting my favorite colors to be the gray tones uh, they look so nice in person yeah like I'm saying those grays just there's there, it's, what is it about them they just have there's a life in there and you know if you look at most painting pre 18 you know 1800 uh, prior to industrial manufacture of paint a lot of the this area is where a lot of the, the majority of the surface of the canvas is covered with grays with these tones that artists have mixed right so if you look at Rembrandt, Michelangelo, Leonardo, um, uh, I mean, oh gosh, all, all of the, the giant names, you can go to, go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art or the Louvre or um, uh, any other big art museum, you'll see most of the, 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 the paintings are using a lot of grays. They're using some shades, some really dark areas to maybe get some of the like the darkest deepest parts of the picture and there's also going to be some of these tints but there's going to be almost none of these really bright saturated well in fact there's not going to be any of these bright colors they're going to be if there is any saturated colors they're going to be around this size side of the neutral core 
just because they didn't have the technology to make these you know super super saturated colors most of the paint that we have today is is synthetic pigments that have been made in a laboratory so they're they're kind of like steroided up right super super bright things like you know if rembrandt saw these colors you know it would just blow his mind he i mean there none of these colors were available to an artist 500 years ago or even really a hundred years ago right so it wasn't really until the 1960s till pop art where we had the synthetic pigments that were created and the invention of acrylic paint so what we've just created this was impossible just 60 70 years ago like absolutely impossible to get those bright colors or these bright colors on the color wheel so that's why it's um just invariably the paintings that artists are making today are unlike any paintings that have ever been made in human history um west coast swing says very useful i seem to need learning to load my brush I, I see i seem to need help learning to hold my brush i go from dry to too loaded yeah yeah it's, i mean that's another th i think challenge that people um especially when they're when you're just starting out is we have this idea that we need to have this like you know uh huge scoop of paint on our brush and that's why when you see me putting paint on my brush i'm often kind of just rubbing it into the paint like i'll be kind of putting it like this rubbing it around like massaging the bristles of the brush and loading it up that way and what i'm i'm not just sort of sometimes i'm trying to figure out what i'm doing or what i've got to say but really what i'm doing is it's like you know it's like shampooing your hair or something right if if i just took shampoo put it on my hair went like this and then ran it under the sink well my hair would probably not be very clean right whereas if i'm taking the shampoo and i'm massaging it into my hair you know then it's more likely that that hair gets a little bit of shampoo every little bit all the way down to the scalp is getting shampoo on it right so i'm loading it up making sure that that paint is getting right into in around those bristles which means that when i start painting i'm going to have an easier time because it's not like i've got some parts of the brush that only have a little bit of paint some got a lot of paint it's all evenly distributed um cynthia says it's amazing how the colors change that's i think it's magic really you can see why um in in terms of like the history of painting how a lot of artists got really interested in alchemy right because especially when artists were mixing their own pigments and they were like these mad scientists with all these different vials and they're bubbling and heating things it looked like frankenstein's um uh workshop right so it wasn't too far off like all those famous artists like like leonardo da vinci were upset became really interested in alchemy which is this idea of creating gold out of other materials right because they were just like wow man like if i mix you know and we're talking back then you'd be literally mixing dead bugs stones and rocks and like maybe your own blood different kinds of food rotten food you'd be mixing them together and then you'd result in these really cool colors it it, it was no leap at all for them to go like huh well if i can mix like a uh a red out of just you know out of these different weird colors neither none of which are red but i mix them together and it creates red maybe i can do that and i can mix gold right so um there is this there's a magical aspect to painting that um which is one of the reasons why it makes it is a little bit difficult for people to get started because it it can seem a little bit confusing which is why i'm trying as best as possible to demystify this stuff uh, and then once you get it, it gets super exciting. Um, Peter says, uh, hi, Michael. My mom is painting with me today. She's curious why it's called Tint Tones Shades for white, gray, black. Good question. Oh, I don't know the entomology, the, the, the um, origin between of, of those words. Tint, tone, and shade. I, if, 
I, I could sit here and just invent <laughs> some ideas for you, but I, I don't know. I don't know the the reason. I mean, I think. I mean, shade would be the most obvious. You know, when we think of like going outside and it's really hot, so you stand in the shade and it's dark. I think that that is probably you know the origin for for you know adding shade or mixing a shade of color. Um, but as for tint and tone, I don't know. I, I don't know the origin. Uh, Emily or Emmett says I can't hear you. Um, it looks I see my my microphone still seems to be working. Uh, I hope I hope that's not a problem other people are having. It's, um, might be sometimes it's just you know YouTube if you depending on the signal sometimes it goes out and it starts back up again. All of a sudden I pause if sometimes that happens a video I'm watching I'll just pause it and I go back a little bit and hopefully kind of buffers and, and sorts that problem out. So I'm sorry you're having trouble with the audio. Um, uh, Peter also says, uh, she, almost, she might, n she, okay, blah, blah. Also, she might not be convinced you are live. If you say, thanks, Debbie, for painting along with me, that would be super. Hi, Debbie. Thanks for painting along with Peter. Peter's been a longtime student of mine. We've, I think you've, ta you've taken every single class that I've taught um, when I was teaching in person. So uh, great to see you, Debbie. I am live. I'm, I'm right here in real time. It is uh, 5.47 on a Thursday afternoon here in Vancouver. Um, uh, ja Jasmine says, this is great. Uh, now I know why I could never have this even background color. I did not know how to add white. Great stuff. Joyce says, thank you. I enjoyed today's lesson. Irene says, uh, sound might be on his end. Yeah, it sounds good here. So, um, okay. So what I do want to show right now, and thanks for everybody for indulging me while I just nattered on for a little while there, is... show you my ideas going forward here and possibly get your input. Well, I do want your input um, if you want to share it with me. So here is, this is kind of just shows you a little bit of the back end of uh, my planning for these classes. So um, May says, I switched mics last time. This mic is not as good as the one you had before. Uh, th yeah, I mean, it's, this was a $50 mic. The other one was like a $250 mic. So not surprised, you know. Um, but surprisingly, this is about the only... I couldn't... If I wanted... If, even if I wanted a more expensive mic like this, I couldn't find it. Anyway, so what we're looking at is kind of my schedule of events here. So we are on session number four here. And then my plan was to do um, next class is paint the screen by Edward Munch. Right, this pretty iconic painting. Um, although I have done that before. Um, like uh, Jeannie was saying, she did the other, um, the value scale painting that I did. That's the nine minute version. There's a, like a nine minute version of heavily edited of painting the screen. So, and I also did a version of uh, Van Gogh's Sunflowers. And I do do those when I'm teaching in class. Oh, where'd that go? Um, so it's possible that over the weekend I might change my mind and not do these ones again and just try doing something a little bit different with you guys. And if you want to watch how to paint the screen or sunflowers, you could, you could watch those other videos. If there's people out there who really, really do want to see the slow version of how we do them, I could still do them. So I'd be interested to hear your comments in the, the comment section below um, right now or after this episode. Um, I, in, when I teach in class, we do paint Matisse's goldfish and people like that one. I, um, and that's, this is really, so often I teach the screen so we can work on warm and cool colors. Oh, where did you go? And then we do the Matisse one so we could work on the value scale and applying tints, tones, and shades into a painting. Um, 
So I am considering maybe either replacing the scream and sunflowers with other paintings also by Munk and by Van Gogh, or doing other things entirely. As you'll see, there's I've got lots of other things that we can do here. So the next series of paintings, I was thinking this artist, her name uh, Hilma Af Klint, was a um, an like one of the most important artists in the history of all ah, this thing just zipping around. I'm gonna take my hand off the mouse and do use the keyboard. Um, she she is one of the most important artists in the history of art, but not very well known because that's just sort of how a lot of uh, women have been sort of treated by history, right? It's his story, not her story, right? Um, so uh, she basically invented abstract art as, as we know it today, kind of about a couple decades before any man really started painting this way. And um, you'll see, if you look her name up, you'll find lots of articles talking about her and, and why she was sort of ignored by history. I just did it again, didn't I? Um, so I thought it might be interesting to actually paint some of her paintings because I think she's one of the great artists. I'm not the only one who thinks this, by the way. There's plenty of people who think this. Um, anyway, the next artist there, Susan Val Valadon, is a, uh, or was an another really important artist who uh, was great friends with Picasso and Matisse and also um, a very famous artist's model. And so she appeared in a lot of other people's paintings. I really like that painting that she did of this cat and flowers. So I thought it might be kind of fun to paint that or maybe just paint the cat itself. Because um, I'm sure there's a lot of people who are watching who have cats who would love to paint a cat. Um, then as we go down here, where are we? To the, the tenth episode, I was thinking of doing a still life and focusing on still life, and probably the master of still life of modern modernist still life is Giorgio Morandi, and so we could—he's kind of famous for painting these cups. Ah, come on! Uh, but there's also a really nice painting of flowers that he did, and you, and you really see him using tints, tones and almost no shade whatsoever. So basically using white and gray in most of the painting and still creating really beautiful paintings. So that might be a fun one to use. Then um, there's some, a, a really beautiful painting by Emily Carr, probably Canada's most famous artist, let alone famous female artist, but l l just the most famous artist from Canada uh, is a woman, uh, Emily Carr, who also, by the way, is a fantastic writer. She became well known for her writings before anybody knew really about her paintings. So her autobiography, uh, she wrote a few kind of autobiographies. Clee Wick is one of the most famous books she wrote and, um, and made her famous really. And it wasn't, it was sort of, once people read her books, like, oh wow, I wanna see her paintings. Um, and then, so, so basically what we're looking at here is kind of playing back and forth between some landscape paintings, paintings of some animals and still lifes, flowers, um, and as we go a little bit, introducing some figurative and a portrait stuff so that people can um, learn to, uh, how, to, how to paint faces and mix skin tones and such. Um, and then as we go into kind of towards like November, doing a couple of fun things for Halloween, um, uh, painting some winter landscapes, again, doing, playing with like, you know, uh, pop art, Keith Haring, Andy Warhol, um, also looking at some more contemporary artists. So like Monica Tapp and Sherry Boyle and Ola Volo. Banksy are all artists that are alive today and um, so that we're not just all painting paintings by people that lived you know a hundred years ago or 200 years ago so trying to um, I, if anything probably the oldest painting that we would be painting might be something like by um, Bertha Morisot who was the only female impressionist that was invited to exhibit with them 
uh, Claude Monet, um, So you can see kind of a variety of artworks here, as well as interspersed through this. So this is not all set in stone, but also uh, doing some actual painting from life. So I'll go buy some flowers and then we'll make some paintings of actual flowers rather than painting other people's flowers, just so I could show you how I would do that in a very condensed period of time. Like trying in, in all of these, trying to do the painting in about an hour, hour and a half or less. So the idea is not to completely reproduce another person's artwork you know, in its most faithful method possible and using the same kind of style they did, but um, to kind of show you how you could approach this given the limited time most people have for painting. Not everybody's got four months to fuss around on a painting. Most of you are probably like, I got an hour this week, I got a couple hours. What can I do in that period of time? So I want to show people that you don't need hours and hours and hours of painting in order to, to make your artwork. So even including um, like Maude Lewis, I don't know if you, anybody saw the, the, um, the recent uh, film about her. So she, so some artists that are really well known, some that aren't, all of these are artists that within the art community are, are certainly well known and appreciated, but uh, Anyway, so here's some other names. So you could so anyway, there's lots of options. Once I started doing this, I kind of I, sp I basically spent my weekend um, instead of playing uh, with our daughter and, and all this stuff is dreaming up this class. And as I started doing, it, I got more and more excited about all the possibilities out there. So. That's the ideas that I have. If you have other things that you're really hoping we would do in the class that I've just somehow, uh, that I promised I was gonna do that, I, I, that you don't see here, I would love to know in the comments what you think. And then I'm certainly happy to incorporate them in here. Those of you guys that are watching now, you know, I, I would love for all of you to continue painting along with me all the way into like January or February of next year. So, what is the kind of stuff that you would like to see? Um, if there's an artist you think that would be great to investigate, um, please let me know. I'd, I'd be, uh, um, yeah. So, uh, you know what? There's, it's, it's, we're almost two hours into the, into this class. So I'm going to end it in just a couple of minutes. There, there was some amazing paintings that people have done that who tagged me in their their photos on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and or and or sent me the images directly um, and I would love to show some of those images and I think I'll do that at the beginning of next class because I think people are going to be blown away by the incredible work that we're all making in this class so um, if you have done something uh, maybe it's even just your color wheel and you're super proud of it, or maybe the, the, the painting that we did of Sonia Delaunay. And I forgot to tell the incredible stories I have about her, so maybe I'll also somehow do a little detour in that. There's so much stuff I want to share with you guys. So um, a, a couple of hours every couple days it just doesn't seem like enough. So anyway, um, I'm gonna share some of the, that great artwork. So if you wanna share yours, send it to me through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all the links to those things are, are down below. And uh, I love the community. I love like there's hundreds of comments here that you guys have been leaving and, and not often directed at me. Sometimes they're your conversations you guys are having with one another. And I think it's just so neat that people were um, gathering here on these Tuesdays and Thursday nights. And, uh, you know, we're having our little kind of virtual studio together. So um, with that, I will bid you all a adieu. Where did that go? Oops, come back here. And um, we will see you guys next uh, next class. So we'll have a few days off. If you want to reproduce the um, exercise, if you want to do, oh, sorry, that's the, I'm just going to turn this off here. 
So if you want to do the cool as well as the warm, that would be a good idea for something you could do over the next couple of days. And you'll really kind of see how those colors um, uh, change, the cool colors change when you add paint to them as well. So, uh, fake to everybody out there for a second, gave me an extra couple seconds. So thank you everyone, enjoy the rest of your week and happy painting. I'm glad we had a chance to do this. Basically this is the last episode where we're doing all these little exercises and for the next 36 or so, or maybe more episodes, we're going to be making paintings each time around. So go out and get a few more canvases because you're going to need them. We're going to be pretty busy. <laughs> okay. We'll talk to you soon, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your evening.